And to you all, good morning. Good morning. And we pray God's blessings on you as we meet together here in the Brayton Church. And I apologize if I have dyslexic again on the scripture reference to the bulletin secretary. The problem is probably not them, it's, it's me, as it usually is. So forgive me. But we will be studying out of John chapter 9 this morning, okay? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh God, we do thank you for the precious opportunity we have to be together this morning on these sacred hours of the Sabbath day here in the Brayton Church. And we pray your spirit will guide us and our minds illuminate them that we may have a greater appreciation of Jesus and what he does to seek to restore the human heart. And I pray, O oh God, that you will make our hearts receptive to that redeeming grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, out of John chapter 9 this morning, the passage for today is a key story in the ministry of Jesus. He has been ministering for about three years now, and in six months, he will be crucified. In this passage is recorded the fifth miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And this one is distinguished by his intent. Jesus knows that what he is about to do will create controversy. And yet, it will have a positive outcome. Amen. So let's look at the story a little bit and the situation as the gospel story tells it to us. Here, beginning at verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. Amen. Now these words of Jesus are significant. Here's a man living in darkness. And Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. But notice the very first words of this narrative. Now as Jesus, what? Passed by. Was Jesus just passing by? <laughs> Isn't it amazing in the stories of the Gospels of Jesus' ministry, when Jesus passes by, something significant happens. Amen. Here is a man living in darkness from birth. And Jesus is passing by. He has great intent Amen. in this situation. Now, in this case, as Jesus explains it, blindness did not come as a result of this man's sin or his parents' sin. He is blind because of the effects of sin Amen. on the human race. You know, there are a lot of things that we experience in life that we don't understand. I have a dear college friend and his wife, Terry and Sharon Zoll. They're, they entered the ministry down in the Texas conference. He was an intern in the San Antonio church. And he and his wife had a 
child, their first child was a daughter. They named her Elisa Beth. Unfortunately, this child was born with a severe case of cerebral palsy. She was so affected that the only way they could nurture her and feed her was to put a feeding tube up through her nose down into her stomach and give her food every day that way. That went on for two years until she caught a cold and it went into pneumonia and she died four days after her second birthday. How do you explain something like that? How do you explain a man who is born blind? There isn't an answer, I don't believe, except that we understand that the nature of sin has so corrupted humanity and this world that there are some things that come as a result of the effect of sin being present in this world. And Jesus recognized that. <coughs> and Jesus says, Who sinned? He answers the question, Who sinned, this man or his parents? And he said, Neither. This man is born blind that the works of God should be revealed in him. God has a means by which to overrule even the effects of sin. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, when you read the story in John chapter 5, a man who had been paralytic for 38 years, and as you read the story, Jesus meets him later, and says to him, don't sin anymore, lest a greater evil come upon you. And the implication is, is that his condition was a result of his own sinful choices. And the story, and this one, tells us that Jesus can even cure that which infects us as well as what affects us. Amen. And Jesus says that this blindness is so the work of God can be revealed in Him. And then Jesus does something that's unique about this healing. You know, at the miracles in the Gospel of John, Jesus really never touches the person. He does the healing without the sense of touch. There is, in a sense, here in this story. But what he does is he stoops down and he uses spit to create a mud pie with his saliva. And he creates this mud and he places it on the man's eyes. And he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's verse 7. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now look. The Pool of Siloam was about 1,300 yards away from this entrance into the temple courts where this man was begging for his living. It was about three-quarters of a mile. They would use this pool for the ceremonial waters during the Feast of Tabernacles. They'd cart this water to the temple. So Jesus tells him to go to the pool of Siloam where ceremonial waters are used for the sanctuary. 
And he goes and he washes. And he comes back seeing. Now this is an unusual way of healing somebody, isn't it? Amen. Uh, couldn't a person <laughs> rationalize and say, what in the world good is this going to do? I'm blind from birth. This guy's put some mud on my eyes and goes, tells me, wash. He doesn't tell him, go wash in the pool of Siloam and you will see. Didn't say that, did he? No. He said, just simply go to the pool of Siloam and wash. How he got there, I don't know. People cared about him, maybe helped lead him there. How does a blind man walk three quarters of a mile without a little of assistance? But he gets there and he washes and he can see. What is interesting is that the waters heal his blindness at the word of Jesus. Amen. Jesus does not have to be personally present for the healing to take place. Amen. Amen. The waters heal at his command. His presence is not necessary. And so this man comes back rejoicing for the first time in his life. He can see. Can you imagine what that would be like? How, we, how you would feel? You can actually see textures and color and depth and content to what is before you. It had to have been an absolutely masterful, elevating experience. Amen. I don't know. This is, this is a really a, a terrific story because now he's going around telling everybody, I've been healed of my blindness. And, and the Bible tells us here in verse 8 and onward, there are various people who begin to question what's going on here. You know, I think all of us would want to know what's going on here. And the Bible says, therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, uh, That's him. Others said, No, he is like him. And, and he said, No, it's, it's me. It's me. And they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. I'm not sure what it was that convinced this man to get up and go to the pool of Siloam. But maybe someone encouraged him to go ahead and do it. You know, when Naaman was healed of his leprosy, he thought the idea of going and dipping in the Jordan River was kind of ludicrous, kind of foolish to do. Why, we've got better waters up there in Syria than what's here in Israel. One of his men that went with him, he says, well, what have you got to lose? You know, might, might try it. You might like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's kind of that kind of reason. Somewhere, something clicked in his mind to at least, to attempt it. What has he got to lose? Great. Except... His blindness. Mm -hmm. Hmm? But these people begin to question it. How did this happen? And he tells us some incredible story. Who in the world is going to get healed by having somebody put some mud on your eyes and go wash in the pool of Siloam? All the blind would do that if that, if that worked. And so the Bible says, 
He says, well, where is this man? I, well, I don't know. So they took him to the Pharisees. Oh, here comes trouble. And a conflict mm -hmm. begins. Verse 13. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. And the Bible says, now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That's an important statement because not only is it wrong to heal on Sabbath, he made mud pies on Sabbath. <laughs> Naughty, naughty Jesus. And the Pharisees in their minds, verse 15 says, the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, I put, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. What a fantastic story. Now you've got to understand, in the Jewish way of thinking of Jesus' day, a person born blind was bl born blind because, because someone sinned. Someone was an evil person. So God cursed him with blindness. Evil person. That's why he's blind. And so when he tells what happened... This guy put clay on my eyes. I washed. I see. Look at the verse 16. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. <laughs> he does not keep the Sabbath. They have a theological dilemma that they have created for themselves. This person is evil, that's why he's blind. But somebody heals him of his blindness, but does it in a way that they think offends the observance of the Sabbath. So this not, must not be real. Something else must be going on. They, they begin to reason to think that this guy really wasn't blind. So they call his parents in. And the parents say to their questions, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. No, we don't know how he now sees. Ask him, he's of age. And notice, notice this. The Pharisees seek to control people with threats and intimidation of those who would seek to follow Jesus. Because the Bible says here, in verse 22, notice what it says, His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. And so, by this threat and intimidation, the parents were really reluctant to get involved in any more of regarding the situation with their son. They'd rather claim ignorance. But the testimony of the healed blind man reveals the unbelief and hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And this next portion of Scripture is tremendous. Look at verse 24. So the Pharisees again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory, we know that this man is a sinner. It is an, it is an evoking of an oath. They do this to Jesus when they demand, when Caiaphas demands, if you are the Christ. I jury thee by the living God. Give God the glory. 
Tell us the truth. We know this man's a sinner. And the man answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. They couldn't get around the reality of what Jesus did. And they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Ouch, ouch. And they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And here comes the real dandy. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from. Yet, he has opened my eyes. Now, we know, here's their theology, now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he what? He hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. nothing. Amen. He nailed them with their own theology. Amen. If he weren't from God, he couldn't open my eyes. But the fact is, I once was blind, but now I see. Wow. The, the stubborn unbelief of individuals is amazing to me. You know, it's like some of these people, my mind's made up, so don't confuse me with the facts. That was the Pharisees. We know this man's a sinner. He broke the Sabbath. And yet, they could not accept the reality of a miracle of a man born blind and now can see. What does it tell us? It tells us, number one, that Jesus is always seeking people to believe in him. Amen. Always. He seeks to heal not only the infection, but the effect of sin. And his healing between the paralytic in chapter 5 of John and the blind man here in chapter 9 is a testimony to both. Amen. And Jesus... And verse 35 tells us, He heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and is he who is talking with you. And for the first time, he really looks at Jesus. Amen. And he says to Jesus, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. My brothers and sisters, when you read John chapter 20, and I forget exactly the verse, but Jesus, but John says, 
many things Jesus did that could not be written in this book, but these things he, he wrote that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and in believing in his name may have life in his name. And the healing of this blind man was the key point of John's Gospel that what Jesus did to reveal the work of God in this man was to lead him to believe in Jesus and have life in his name, not just sight. And Jesus goes on to say here in verse 39, And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. What an interesting statement. Jesus comes into the world, and his ministry tends to divide people, doesn't it? Jesus comforts the afflicted, but he afflicts the comfortable. The heroes of Jesus' stories are people who are regarded by society as the outcasts. And the villains of Jesus' stories and his narratives are the people who are viewed by society as being respectable and upright. Pharisees and a blind man. And here is one, born blind, but now can see who believes in Jesus and has life in his name. You know, I think that this is so interesting in the stories of Jesus. And even in his parables, he tells, he makes this same thing of how individuals, you know, like the Pharisees and this publican praying in the temple. And who goes to his home justified? The guy who is viewed as such a terrible sinner. And Jesus sits down and receives and eats with sinners. And the proud and the self-righteous who think they are, have religion enough for themselves are the ones who find themselves standing outside. And never receiving that which God would want to give. The miracle is a judgment. It divides believers from unbelievers. Amen. And the Pharisees' greatest problem was their pride and their unbelief. Their refusal to believe. Even though there was ample evidence given to them for it. For this man could testify, I once was blind, but praise God, now I see. Those that cannot see begin to see, and those who claim to see are blinded. Look at what Jesus says in verse 40 and 41, and some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and they said to Jesus, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to him, If you were blind, you would have no sin. You know, a person who is totally and completely in ignorance, how can they be held accountable in the same way of somebody who has been informed? Isn't that true? true. But Jesus says, But now you say we do see. Therefore, your sin remains. When a person can't even admit that he has need of a Savior, how could he ever be receptive to receiving one? Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. Until you sense your need, Nothing will happen. And the Pharisees never felt their need. 
They thought they were, I, I, we're Moses' disciples. God spoke to Moses. And Jesus' reply probably would be, if you really believed Moses, you would believe me. Because Moses spoke of me. And their own ignorance of the scriptures led them to reject Jesus as the Son of the living God. My brothers and sisters, we have great hope knowing that God can open our eyes. Amen. You know, I read this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 13 with some intrigue, where Paul says, We see through a glass how? Darkly. We only know how? In part. We have limitations. Limitations that come as a result of the infection as well as the effects of sin. But in spite of that, there is a Savior who can direct our path because He is the light of the world. And to everyone who seeks Him, they will hear a voice that says, this is the way, walk you in it. He's the light of the world. He will direct our path. He will lead us to Himself. And isn't that our Christian experience? Is trusting Him enough to lead us to where He wants us to be? and wants us to do, that we can be ambassadors of light, as was Jesus. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. This man received his sight so that through his sight, he could convince others that God could do for them what he did for him. The greatest thing that we can share with others is our own testimony. Can't be denied. And if we tell them what Jesus did for us, we may convince many that what Christ did for us is for them also. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for the story of Jesus. His compassionate heart for those who have been affected by sin seems to have no limit. We don't understand what all thing, why all things happen as they do that are seem to be so tragic. But you are a God who cares about our condition. And you have the ability to give us sight when we can't see. You give us a discernment that helps us to understand your will for our life. Oh God, sweep away the blindness in our hearts that we may see Jesus and worship Him. For we pray it in His name. Amen. Father in heaven, may the message that we hear this morning be the message of the angels singing over the, over the plains. And we pray that our hearts will be open to hear the good news in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My favorite book in the Bible is Ephesians. And it's my favorite book because it was in Ephesians that I first learned about the grace of God. 
and I grew up uh, as a part of this church. And uh, I think there has been a much greater emphasis on the grace of God in the recent years. Can you say amen to amen. that? Um, but when I was growing up, uh, it was not prominent. And I remember a pastor coming and having a sermon at Andrews University about the grace of God. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, all of a sudden the light was turned on for by grace you are saved, or you have been saved, actually, it's a past tense, by grace you have been saved, uh, through faith, and it's not your own doing, it is the gift of God, as any man should boast. And as a result of that passage of scripture, and uh, Ephesians being my favorite book, I... I had heard about people who memorized scripture, and so I decided to memorize uh, the book of Ephesians. But since I have such a poor memory, I have to go over and rememorize it over and over again. But it is a fantastically beautiful book that puts the gospel, you know, sometimes we get the, what is it we say, we get the horse before the, the, cart, before the, the cart before the horse. Yeah. And uh, Ephesians puts the horse in front of the cart. And we're going to take a look at that book this morning. Just uh, three, verses 3 through 8. Uh, but before we take a look at the verses that we're going to study together, and we're just going to let them, uh, we're going to hover over, over those verses together this morning, and we'll just open up what they are really saying to us. Um, the book of Ephesians, Paul addresses to the saints mm -hmm. in Ephesus. How many saints do we have here this morning? We're all saints. All are all saints. We're all saints. Mm -hmm. If we've given our lives to Jesus Christ and we've been set aside, we're all saints. Not in the Catholic sense where... We have so many good works that we can pass them on to the rest of the people. And when you take a look at the Ephesians, they had some problems in their church, even though Paul addresses them as saints. So let's look at the background. Paul spent more time in this church than he did any other church. Did you know that? At least as far as what's recorded. He spent three years there. And... Uh, when he arrived there, Apollos had been preaching, and he asked them if they knew about the Holy Spirit. Remember what they said? We hadn't even heard so much as the Holy Spirit, and so Paul taught them uh, about the Holy Spirit, and they were baptized, and they spoke in different languages. Later on, Paul came back to them, and uh, this was his last visit. He didn't actually come into the town. They met him out someplace beyond the town, and he said, this is my last time I'm going to be able to visit with you. I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me. And they all wept on him, and he whipped it, wept together with them, and he headed on to Jerusalem. But before he did, he said, there are going to be some grievous wolves that will come in among you, and some will raise up amongst you, and they will teach false doctrines and they will seek to draw you away from the Lord Jesus. And then we find the Ephesians mentioned in another place in the book of Revelation. Where is that? Yeah, first church, right? And apparently they had gotten Paul's message so well that they were really great at getting rid of and evaluating those who were sharing doctrines, but they had lost something, right? What was it that they lost? Their first love. Not only their first love for God, but their first love for one another. So, Paul writes to the Ephesians, and uh, we're going to take a look at the first verses 3 through 8. And I'm going to be sharing those with you from the Revised Standard Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him 
before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before Him. He destined us in love to be His sons according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we hope to have... No. Hmm? No. Is that what the... No. no. It says, in Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. Wow. Do you feel like you've been lavished upon this morning? Well, let's take a look at this passage of Scripture and unpack it a little bit more. Paul begins by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're just going to go through this by <laughs> phrase by phrase and just study it a little bit together. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thought that Jesus was God. But God is His, the Father is His God. How can that be? Yes, you're right. There are people who go around the community saying that we are only to worship the Father. Jesus had a God. Can't you see? Here it is in this passage of Scripture. But like you said, Jesus was fully God, but then he became fully human. And as a human being, he needed to depend upon his Father in heaven, just like we depend upon Jesus. So Jesus was fully human, and therefore God was his God and his Father, because he depended upon him. Sometimes, you know, we're right in what we affirm, but wrong in what we deny. Often that's what happens when you get into false doctrine. We affirm that Jesus was God, but when we turn around and deny that He was not, or we say that He was not God, then that becomes a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So, let's continue on with this passage of Scripture. Uh, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, in Christ with every spiritual blessing where? In the heavenly places. Wow. That's a big mouthful, isn't it? Uh, we have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And those blessings are in the heavenly places. Now, we have lots of blessings that are here, right? Mm -hmm. We have the blessings of life and family and food and, and so many things. But we also have every spiritual blessing. I titled this sermon in the past, We Already Have Everything We Need. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. If you have every spiritual blessing, then you have everything you need, but those spiritual blessings are in heavenly places, and they're in Christ Jesus. Now, did you know that we as saints are also in heavenly places? Did you know that? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. If we are in Christ Jesus, then we are indeed in heavenly places. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 6. He says that we've been raised up with Christ and we are seated with Jesus in heavenly places that in the coming ages God might show to us the incredible riches of His kindness and grace to us in Christ Jesus. So we've been blessed. Already blessed. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You know, we play, pray, bless so-and-so, and, so and bless Aunt Sue, and bless Uncle Dan, and bless the missionaries and call porters. And one day I began thinking about that. Why am I praying about blessing people? Because God's already blessed them, right? 
So what we pray is that God will open their eyes to see and open our eyes to see the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And now, as you go on into this passage of Scripture, you discover four specific blessings that Paul talks about. The first one is, even as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world, the of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love chose us before the foundation of the world. That's good news. Before you had ever done anything good or bad, God chose you. God didn't choose you because you were holy and blameless. He chose you to be holy and blameless. And by the way, this is written to Christians, the Ephesian Christians, way back then. I grew up thinking that the only people who were going to be holy and blameless before God were Seventh-day Adventists at the end of time. But I discovered that the Ephesians were chosen to be holy and without blame before Him in love, and that they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And that's the privilege of every single person who is a Christian to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. And he talks about that later in the first <coughs> chapter about how we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee that we're going to get the whole thing in the end. So, we have been chosen in Him to be holy and blameless before Him in love. Chosen not because we were holy and blameless, we were chosen to become. We belong in order to become. You know, being chosen is a wonderful thing, and when you're not chosen, it doesn't feel very good, does it? When I was born, my uh, parents were older. My dad was 53 and my mother was 43. And after I was born, my mother had a nervous breakdown. Don't blame me, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I, I was not planned. I was an afterthought. But with God, None of us here are afterthoughts. God chose you and God chose me before the foundation of the world. Before we had ever done anything, He chose us to belong to Him. Amen. Yes, to be chosen is a wonderful thing. I'm short, and I'm looking forward to growing up in heaven. Uh, and often when the ball teams were chosen, sometimes I would be chosen maybe third or fourth, but sometimes I would be chosen last. And you go out and play right field. And that wasn't a very good feeling. But God has chosen you and chosen me. And that should be a wonderful privilege for us. And we should bask in that. Too often we question our salvation and we look at, I call, spiritual navel-gazing, or we're walking on eggshells with God. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a healthy respect and re respect and recognize that it's not once saved, always saved, but we should be able to sing the song Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. And his child and forever I am. We should be able to sing that. Shouldn't we? 
You know, this business of being chosen, some people have gotten it all mixed up. And we go to the next part of this passage of Scripture. It says that we are destined to be His sons according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He freely, freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't between a rock and a hard spot. He chose us and He predestined us to be His sons and He did it freely according to the purpose of His will. And that was to the praise of His glorious grace. Now, people have got into all kinds of arguments about what predestined means. And I don't know entirely what it means. I know that it means to be predetermined or pre-chosen or pre-decided. That's what it means in the Greek. But there are some people who came up with the idea that God has chosen some people to be saved and pre-decided that some people were going to be lost. It's called double predestination. And how can you resist the will of God? But it doesn't make any sense to me, particularly when you compare it with the scripture in Peter that says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, if we are lost, the only reason we are lost is because we decided not to accept the predetermined will of God that we be, would be saved. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. And in case you're thinking about whether you have been chosen or not, just realize that God chose you before the foundation of the world to belong to Him. Not because you were perfect, not because you were holy, and without blame, but in order that you might become before Him holy and without blame. Well, the passage of Scripture in the original language where it says that we have been chosen to be His sons really is saying we have been adopted into His family. Amen. Adopted. What happens in adoption? Get a name change. Get a name change. Any other ideas? What happens in adoption? You become, you're bought with a price. You become, you become a part of a family mm -hmm. that was not originally yours, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't really belong. You were not blood born. You were chosen and adopted by someone who was not your original parents, right? Now, in a sense, that's true about us, because in the flesh, we became a part of uh, the family of the devil. But then there is another sense that, is, that that's not true about us, because God created us, and He redeemed us, so we really belong to Him, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, He has taken us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and He has adopted us into His family. And when you adopt somebody, some places have a law that once you've been adopted, you have to be able to get the inheritance that belongs to the regular children. Isn't that right? And that's really what God is saying in the New Testament. We have been adopted and we are the inheritance that goes to Jesus belongs to us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You know, my wife and I lived over in Korea for a long time, and we brought babies from Korea that were not wanted. They were born illegitimately or some kind of a problem, and so uh, we were able to, uh, to enlist in a service that uh, would would adopt the children and we would be the ones who would be take care of them on the airlines. 
And I'll never forget one time when I brought a couple of babies, and Jeanette had one or two, I don't remember. But anyway, we had a couple of babies, and we came from Seoul to Detroit, and then I dropped off one baby, and then I went to, uh, on to New York City, and I was really bushed. Um, it's a long flight, and uh, I think I had probably been up 36 hours, but there was nothing like meeting the parents of that cute little boy and being able to give that baby into their arms as tears of joy flooded their eyes. And it was just such a wonderful reward to be a part of that. And God, there is what? Tears in heaven, tears of joy. There is joy in heaven when we turn to God and we give our hearts and our lives to Him. Well, we've discovered that we've been chosen uh, to belong and to become, and we have been destined to be His sons. Now, I want to ask a question as we're thinking about this chosen, and I'm going to go back again. Who are some of the people that God chose? Mm -hmm. Abraham. Yeah, Abraham. Isaac. Isaac. I'm thinking about some people in the New Testament. John the Baptist. Paul. Peter. John. James. John and James. What do you know about these characters? They were characters. Yeah, they were characters, right? <laughs> Didn't have halos. Uh, Peter had hoof and mouth disease or foot and mouth disease. <laughs> And uh, one, at one point in the New Testament, Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, what? Satan. Satan. And, and James and John were called sons of thunder, right? And you remember the story about how they wanted to call fire down from God out of heaven to destroy people who weren't a part of their group. I wonder sometimes if maybe we aren't a bit like they are. Uh, and then there was, like you said, the Apostle Paul, who was a murderer. Would you choose him as your pastor if you looked at his resume? Hmm? Persecutor, murderer, uh, in and out of jail, uh, had problems getting along with the leaders in the church sometimes created difficulties wherever he went, would you choose him? Hmm? Makes you look good. Yeah. <laughs> Makes all of us look good, doesn't it? You could, so, you could imagine he would love much because he was yes. given much love. Yes. And doesn't Jesus say that he who has sinned much loves much? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what he was saying about the adulterous woman and Simon? He gave that illustration. The person who owes more money uh, realizes how much they've been forgiven. Well, last of all, let's talk about uh, a couple of more things. We've been redeemed by his blood. Redeemed by his blood. Think about that for a little bit, will you? Mm -hmm. This time of year, we're thinking about Jesus coming and being a human being. And last week, my wife and I went to a church and they enacted the birth of Jesus. And the person who portrayed Mary, uh, I, I hadn't thought about this. You know, we have the manger scene that we see as being antiseptic. Uh, but that's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. And Mary, this person portrayed Mary as asking God, why? Why? In a stinky, smelly stable, your, your son would be born. Why? Uh, you know, it wasn't all that antiseptic. And it wasn't all that antiseptic about what they were saying about him either, right? right? 
illegitimate child. Yeah, we know about the Holy Spirit. Yes, we know all about that. Babies, of course, are born by Holy Spirit every day, huh? Mm -hmm. No, Jesus came into this world and he came and he was rejected by the people that he came to save. I don't know if any of you have watched The Passion of the Christ. Any of you watch that? With my eyes yes. closed a lot. With your eyes closed a lot? Um, well, uh, there was a lot of debate about whether people should watch it or not. And um, I was a pastor of a church, and I felt that I needed to see what was being said out in the community. And so I went to see it, and I went home after being there, and uh, I had to lay down. It was so intense. You know, we see pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross with a halo on his head and no blood. Or maybe a drop here or there. But as this person portrayed Jesus, I had never seen so much violence heaped upon any single human being. And in the picture, his back was shredded by the whip. And then Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Feeling totally and completely rejected by his Father. And as I watched this experience, and I wouldn't recommend it, I, would not, I, I don't want to watch it again. But as I watched this, I came away with two thoughts that were very powerful in my mind. And one of them was, if this was God, then no one could ever say that God did not pay a big enough price for Amen. us. He paid the price of his blood for us. It wasn't the price of money, and it wasn't the price of gold and silver, but it was the price of his own life. And the other thing I came away with from this is if this was God, and I believe it is, then no one could ever say that God did not love me. Can you say amen to that? Amen. 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 Last of all, in this passage of Scripture, it talks about being forgiven. Not only being forgiven of our mistakes, but of our trespasses. The trespasses were not merely mistakes. Trespasses were not merely sins of ignorance or sins of that were not willful. A trespass was when you put a sign up in your yard and said, no trespassing, and you ended up going across the sign saying, I don't care what that sign says. <coughs> a willful sin. If there is no forgiveness for willful sin, there is no hope for anyone. Amen. But Jesus forgave and forgave and forgave and continues to forgive. And what promise do we have in the New Testament? If, well, first of all, it, this is in 1 John, the first chapter, and it says, if we say we have no sin, We are what? We deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves and we are liars and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful, what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, Scripture itself can sometimes be a bit confusing. 
And this passage of scripture was confusing to me for a while. Because if Jesus forgave me of my sins, why was I still having problems with sin? Didn't, doesn't it say he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness? And yet I'm still battling sometimes and falling. And so sometimes I ended up questioning if I still have fallen in sin, then maybe I wasn't forgiven either. But when you read this in the Greek, it's a present, continuous, active verb. And it says that he who sins and confesses his sins and continues to confess his sins will be forgiven and will be continued to be forgiven and he will continue to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Can you Robert say... Robert says that we yeah. should forsake our sins. Yes, we should forsake our sins. And praise God that God doesn't want us to stay as sinning. And yet there is the promise that says, if a person does sin, we have what? We have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous. And, you know, we all need an advocate, don't we? I don't have wings here, and none of you have wings here yet, and you won't have wings until Jesus takes away the sinful human flesh that is a part of our experience. And so we need God's grace, and we need Him as an ongoing, continuous Savior. So, what do we have? What are the blessings? We have, number one, we have been chosen. We have been adopted into His family. And this has been predestined, not based upon your works. And we have redemption. And we have forgiveness of our trespasses according to what? The riches of His grace, which He has lavished upon us. I want you this morning to reach out and grab hold of the riches of the grace of Jesus Christ. Don't look at yourself. Because if you keep looking at yourself and you're honest with yourself, you know that it's true that there is no one without sin. And so by God's grace, we come to God and we ask Him to forgive us. Why do we ask Him to forgive us? Because we need it. Isn't that true? Amen. We don't come with merit saying, You owe me forgiveness. We come asking for forgiveness because we need it. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. And can you say amen to a Savior who has chosen us, adopted us, and redeemed us, and forgiven us. And that's what this story is all about this year. Let's sing our closing song together. Let's bow our heads briefly in prayer, shall we? Oh Lord, we do thank you today that we have this privilege to assemble together. These sacred hours of the Sabbath day provide for us that communion with one another as well as with you. <coughs> and we pray that it will be sweet today. And as your word is proclaimed, may we be reminded afresh of the God who is in control of the affairs of this world. And as we trust him, 
all things in our lives will turn out all right. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, the story of John 11 tells us of Jesus' crowning miracle of his ministry. And he's all well aware of the bitter hatred of him by his enemies and their opposition to his ministry. Yet he knows that there will be a greater good that will come out of this event. And so he proceeds. And as we begin to read the story here in John chapter 11, starting at verse 1, the Bible says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, and whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said to his disciples, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed there two more days in the place where he was. And then, after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now, if you have a loved one who is really sick, what would you do? Stay where you are two days? You'd be Johnny on a spot, right? Heading there. See what you can do to help. Try to minister to them some way. Is Jesus insensitive? No. No, we know he's not. But yet he tarries longer when he learns of his sickness. Does Jesus delight to heal people yes. in his ministry? Amen. Whole towns knew nothing of sickness where Jesus passed by. And yet Jesus seems to tarry but for a purpose. In many ways... It is a test of faith, especially for the sisters of Lazarus. They're, they're, they've sent a messenger, come, heal our brother, he's sick. You know, this, this man that you love, come, heal him. And he doesn't come. And maybe even the disciples scratch their head. They know the closeness that Jesus has with Lazarus and his family, his sisters. Why doesn't Jesus go take care of business? It's a, in a sense, his tearing becomes a test of faith of whether or not they're really going to trust Jesus, even though he doesn't come immediately. And how often that is for us. How often we pray and we want that need met now. 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 Right now, Lord. And for whatever reason, we don't know why, God seems to tarry for a period of time. But does God promise, does His promises ever fail? No. no. Never. Never. Test of faith. Jesus tarries for a purpose. He tarries because he is going, he is about to demonstrate his divinity. Amen. That he is the Son of God. And he tarries 
so that this will cause his disciples to have complete trust in him. I mean, come on, folks. If you're following a man, you're following a teacher, you're following a man who claims to be the Messiah, and he can raise the dead, won't you have complete confidence in him? Amen. Jesus is tearing for a purpose. And think about it. If Jesus had been present at the home of Lazarus and his sisters, would death ever have occurred? No. And if that had been the case, this miracle would have never been demonstrated to show his power over death and the devil. Amen. So Jesus waits. And you know, in Jewish thought, to add one other point to this, tearing of Jesus for a purpose. In Jewish thought, a person dead four days could not be revived. So Jesus deliberately waits until Lazarus is dead. Four days. So that this miracle of resurrecting Lazarus could not be denied by those who opposed him. Amen. And by others who may have been impressed with Jesus, but now seeing a resurrection of a man who's been dead four days comes to life. Ain't Jesus smart? <laughs> he knows what he's doing. So, finally Jesus says, let's go to Judea again. Now the disciples are reluctant to do that because they know his enemies are there. They've been trying to get to him. You read the previous chapter of John in chapter 10. They took up stones to kill him because he claimed to be equal with God. Jesus said, well, you don't, you don't like that. You don't want to believe in me. Believe in the works that I do. That I am in the Father and he is in me. So, they decide they're going to return and to go with Jesus. Thomas says in verse 16, Well, let us also go that we may die with him. <coughs> what a pessimist. Yeah. Right? Going into the lion's jaws. We're going to get it. Well, I will go with him. So they arrive. And the Bible tells us about how Jesus comes to Bethany doesn't go to the house. Sends a messenger ahead. Speaks to Martha. Tells her that the master is here. And she runs out to see Jesus. And in her grief and her sorrow, she spills out the words that you and I would have said. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Mm -hmm. And Jesus sp sparks the measure of faith within her through her grief. And she responds to Jesus, Lord, if you had not been here, verse 21 and verse 22, if you had not been if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And is that true? Amen. My brothers and sisters, if Jesus prays for us, 
Will something happen? Amen. The Son of God has the heart of the Father. Amen. Jesus, the righteous one, is the one whom God would say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When He prays, when He asks, it doesn't go on deaf ears, does it? And Jesus responds to her in verse 23 and says, Your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She understood that. Amen. She wasn't a Sadducee. Amen. They believe in resurrections. Didn't believe in the existence of angels. But she believed in the word of God. Amen. What a talk. I believe he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus makes his great pronouncement of the reality of who he is. And he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Yes. And she said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Jesus is stating the reality of who he is. I am. There's the sacred name, my friends. Amen. Ego I me in the Greek. Read the Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures in the Greek. And where the sacred name is used in the text, guess what they put? Ego I me. The great I am is there. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was. They go, I me, I am. And they took up stones to kill him. Jesus is expressing the reality of who he is. Amen. And so finally, he comes to the tomb. <clears throat> Jesus weeps. He weeps for the loss of Lazarus and what death has done to bring such grieving sorrow to the human family. Amen. And think about it, my brothers and sisters. If Adam and Eve really could have seen in the future what their transgression would bring about, would that have shaped their choices? But God said, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And the devil sold them a spiritual Mickey. You won't really die? For God knows the day you eat of this fruit, you'll become like gods. You don't need God. You'll be God. And Jesus weeps over the deception that Satan has given to the human race. Yes. Yes. He weeps for those who stood by, who mourn hypocritically, hired mourners. Some of them were family members and friends of the family. Some of them were ardent and bitter opponents of Jesus. And they're mourning hip hypocritically. And Jesus weeps for their unbelief their refusal to believe, even though the evidences 
of who he is has been given time and time again. Amen. So he comes to the tomb and he does something that is unusual. Look at verse 38 and 39 of John 11. It says, Then Jesus came again. Jesus came, came again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, What? Take away the stone. Take away the stone. Did he need somebody to take away the stone? Angels could have done it. Jesus just could have said, no more stone. But this is important to understand, my brothers and sisters, in the scope of redemption and God restoring the human race back to himself. He wants human cooperation. Amen. Amen. He wants human involvement. Yes. He wants them to do what they can do. And what they can't do, he will do. Amen. It's cooperation with God. Amen. It is rooted in faith, my brothers and sisters. Our sanctification is rooted in faith and trust in God's promises. But it is not by faith alone. Amen. It is by acting on what God reveals to us to do and what we can do. The Holy Spirit didn't put your clothes on for you today, did he? You did that yourself. He inspired you. He convicted you. Today is Sabbath. You need to be in the Brayton Church. Amen. Get ready. Amen. You know where your underwear is. You know where your dress, your pants, your shoes are. Put them on. Get in your car and drive safely to church. And as you did that, the Spirit of God kept speaking to you. Today I'm going to bless you. Today I'm going to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. Amen. Because you cooperated <clears throat> with God. Amen. And Jesus is describing the necessity of human beings to cooperate with him. Take away the stone. And they do. Yeah. And then Martha objects. Lord, his body has seen corruption. He's been dead four days. It stinks in there. You bet it does. But Jesus, with gentleness, turns to her and says, Did not... I say to you, you shall see your brother again. And she steps back. And then Jesus prays. He prays. And then he says, with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! My brothers and sisters, if Jesus had not spoken Lazarus' name specifically, <laughs> All of them would have come. everybody who had ever died would have come forth from the grave because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Amen. In Jesus, my friends, this resurrection occurs because in Jesus is life unborrowed and underdraw, un underived. Amen. He has Amen. life within himself. Amen. And though he lives in subjection to the Father, in dependence of the Father, he is inherently divine. He is the God-man. Amen. 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 He is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. And the Holy Spirit. And Jesus demonstrates the reality of his 
divinity. Amen. And people are amazed. Guy's dead four days. Can't revive him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have Jesus who is the resurrection and the life standing before this tomb. And then Jesus and comes up, you know, the way they buried their family members, about the only place where you had movement was at your waist. So he comes, kind of hobbling out, you know, he's restrained because he's wrapped in grave clothes. And Jesus says, loose him and let him go. You know, it's amazing what God can do to touch a person's life. A life filled with all kinds of dysfunctional <coughs> behaviors, addictions. Some people just, it's incredible. The place from which God is able to draw them to himself out of, out of a cesspool of life in which they are drowning. And somehow he's able to speak to the heart that causes them to respond to the call of God to their heart. <coughs> and at that very instant they respond, God is there with them. The Savior reaches out in mercy, forgives their sins, accepts them as his child, imparts the Spirit to bring new birth. Amen. Amen. Does that eliminate everything in their life? You know better than that, don't you? Doesn't it eliminate everything? And so God is saying to, if you please, to the church, loose him, let him go. Don't let the person crawl out of their mess alone. Assist them. Amen. 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 Help remove the shackles. Help remove the problems. Loose him and let him go. And everybody is stunned. To see a man who has been dead for days, living, breathing, rational, and completely healthy. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and even his enemies are awed and speechless. And what are the results? Look at John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made Christ, made Jesus a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. So Lazarus is now feasting. He's one of the guests of honor. Amen. Isn't it amazing how God can treat us like this way? With all of our mess of our past, all the bad choices we have made, maybe possibly in our lives, that when he calls us to himself, we are privileged to sit down as a guest of honor. In the presence of Jesus. What a, what a truth that is. And here is Lazarus feasting. He is, he is enjoying life again. He's, he's making an impact on the lives of others. Look at verses 9 and through 11 of John 12. Now a great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. 
But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death, death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Now Lazarus is witnessing. He has a living testimony to give. To those who kind of wonder, questioning, kind of standing on the fence, now with the resurrection of Lazarus and his giving of his own testimony, many went away believing in Jesus. <coughs> and here are the chief priests who know that Lazarus has been dead four days and now he is alive and he testifies how hypocritical and unbelieving they are. They are unmasked. Amen. And they plot to kill him. Get rid of the evidence. Before start, people start believing all this. Wow. What are the results of all this? What are... What are the lessons of all this story? Number one, I would say this. That Jesus truly cares about our sorrows. For it is then that he really is closest to us. In our grief and sorrow, we may not perceive it. But the Son of God is closest to us in our greatest need. Amen. Amen. He truly does care about us. And He has made provision ultimately to make all things right. That's what we believe as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Jesus is coming again soon. That is not just a hope. That is a what? Blessed hope. A blessed hope. Amen. And Jesus will make all things right. Amen. There may be re weeping for a night, brothers and sisters, but praise God, joy comes in the morning. Amen. That's a two-hander. <laughs> Jesus cares about our sorrows. He is closest to us in that sorrow. <coughs> that should be a comfort to us. Amen. And secondly, there is nothing, I emphasize that word, there is nothing that Jesus cannot defeat Except an unbelieving heart. Amen. But to those of us who believe in He who is the resurrection and the life, there's nothing that He cannot defeat. And he will continue to reign, 1 Corinthians 15 says, until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed death. is death. Amen. Amen. And lastly, the person who trusts in Jesus genuinely places their trust in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, is victorious even in death. Amen. 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 Even in death. Because I live, Jesus said, you shall live also. Amen. Death may be an enemy, Still is. But praise God, it's a conquered one. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Life unborrowed, underived. I willingly 
finally lay down my life, I take it up again, Jesus says. When the angel comes down from glory, rolls away the stone and says, Jesus of Nazareth, your father calls you. The inherent divinity within Jesus invigorates the humanity and he comes to life by a life that was already in himself. We've been in this world too long, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And there are too many people who haven't understood this precious hope that we have in Christ. And so maybe it's time we roll away the stone and let God do something miraculous through the church. Amen. That God manifest himself in such powerful and mighty ways that others who haven't yet been convinced will see and believe in Jesus because of the testimony and the praise of his people who have found him to be true. Amen. And faithful. Amen. Let's launch into 2014 with a greater determination, brothers and sisters, that we are going to be channels of light and blessing to others to convince them. As John wrote his gospel, these things I write that you may know the Son of God and may believe on his name and thus have eternal life. And we can tell our story. Amen. We can tell the testimony of the message we believe to convince others that what Christ has done for us is for them also. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Amen. And that as we look forward to the future, and the soon glorious return of Jesus, that God will have redeemed a countless number of others because he has worked through those who removed the barriers, who removed the stone, who helped them, who loosed them and let them go free. Amen. And we rejoice forevermore at the feet of Jesus. Because Jesus did that for us. Amen. What a God. Amen. What a Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that this event in Jesus' life is recorded for us. If ever before we didn't have a reason to truly trust him, we now do. Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, that we might even have victory in him, even in death. Oh God, may our lives be hid in Christ today. May our lives bear testimony the great power of his love and grace. May you lead us to others who hear, need to hear that story, that they too may be convinced that the loving Savior and his mercy and power is for them as well. To that end, I pray you will bless us for this coming year, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.